Hello, everybody. My name is Matt McCleary, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the Future of Ship Finance webinar. This is our fourth webinar during our virtual Marine Money Week. And uh, while we are very sorry that we can't be together in New York this week, uh, I have to say it's been a fantastic series of events. And I hope that you'll share this feeling. Whenever I tune into the webinars, I, I do feel connected. It's great to see friends and hear voices. And, and I always have a laugh and come away learning a little bit about what's happening in the, in the market. Um, that's our goal today. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover. Um, we're about 700 people registered for the event today and I think over 2,000 for the week. So we're really uh, gratified to have uh, you know so many people uh, connecting. Um, before we kick off the session, I'd like to introduce my colleague, John Chia, who is gonna take us through some of the um, sort of technical elements of the webinar and also kind of the ground rules. So John, over to you. Thanks, Matt. So this is just a quick note on how we'll be handling the Q&A session today, which if you have tuned into our previous sessions, it's a lot similar, but with one small tweak. So more on that in a second. For this webinar, the audience, you, will all be muted to ensure audio, audio quality control. During this webinar, you will have the opportunity to ask questions to the panelists. This is a whole, a whole reason we do this live and risk a boatload of things going wrong during the broadcast. So please take advantage of this and ask the questions. To ask questions, simply enter your question in the text box at the bottom of the control panel where it says questions, like that I've shown on my screen. I will receive them at the, end of the, at the end of the webinar and I'll ask them on your behalf. These questions will be anonymous, so there should be no fear of a stupid question as I will be the only one looking to fall. The only tweak that we will be doing for this session is that for those questions that come in early enough, we will look to ask them during the panel session rather than waiting to the end. This way, your question has the potential of helping direct the conversation. Finally, if you want to collapse your menu to see all these bright cherry faces, simply click on that orange slash red box with the arrow on it, and it should collapse the, the menu. Um, so that's all from me. So without further ado, let me hand it back to Matt to kick this panel off. Great. Thanks, John, and, and welcome again, everyone. This is um, a topic that's near and dear to, I think, everyone who's tuned into this uh, webinar. So I'm delighted uh, to have the opportunity to moderate, and I am thrilled to have uh, the panelists that we have today. Um, if I were you, I would get a notepad and a pen and, and kind of lean forward and, and listen, because I think um, we're very fortunate to have some of the most active, sort of tuned in players uh, with us today. Uh, David Marcus uh, is known to many of you. Uh, he's from Evermore, institutional investor. Uh, David is... Um, really unique in the sense that not only is he a large investor in the sector, but he's also really made a commitment to being part of this community. A lot of investors sort of come in and out of these markets opportunistically. David may, I wish he had done that from time to time, but he is, uh, he's been a great kind of member of the Marine Money family and we're really happy to have you. Michael Parker with Citi. Uh, what can we say about Michael? He is a true uh, veteran of this business. And City has been uh, financing ships for a long time. I think what makes Michael and City so important on the panel is that they've always been on the sort of leading edge of changes and, and evolution in the business. So super interested to hear from Michael. And Doug Mavernack, uh, Doug, great to have you with us. Uh, I think we met probably 15 years ago when you were an analyst at Jefferies. And you have been uh, kind of full time in this space now as uh, running the investment banking business of uh, Jefferies, which everyone knows is a major franchise in, in shipping. Um, so we're very lucky to have you guys. I'm going to do my best to kind of um, cover everything we can cover. As John said, we'd love to have some questions. I find in watching webinars that a lot of the best questions kind of come from around the world in the field. So please don't hesitate. Um, so we're going to kick it off with a quick slide before we get into the ship finance uh, the meat of the matter. I want to just kind of go around the dial with you guys. Uh, sorry if any of this surprises you. Um, just like to hear kind of how you're doing. Why don't we start with uh, Doug? Doug, if you could just quickly in one or two words answer these questions, uh, then we'll go to David and to Michael. So, Doug. Sure thing, Matt. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so, first question where are you? Um, where I was for much of March, April, May, and early June was Houston. Um, Houston gets hot and humid at this time of the year, so this weekend I uh, flipped to Park City and trying to uh, cool off up here for a little while. Uh, what do you miss most during the lockdown? Um, quite honestly, I miss being in front of people, being in person, meeting with clients. You know, as you mentioned, Matt, been in the space 15, almost 20 years now, um, and what started as clients are now friends, and so whenever you're not able to kind of 
have a beer, have a glass of wine, have a dinner, just have a chat uh, in person is the thing I miss most. Music that I've uh, listened to most, not a ton of music, but I tell you, I've been uh, catching up on a whole lot of old sports replays, everything from college football stuff in the 80s, uh, more recent Mike Tyson fights, baseball games, Premier League soccer matches from a long time ago, Premier League starting up to, again today, so that's exciting. Um, what changes do you think that will stick in your life? You know, that's a difficult one because here in the U.S., we're still very much in lockdown mode for the most part, you know, so you know, it, it kind of clouds your perspective a bit because you talk to clients in Germany and Greece and the Germans are, are back to normal or getting close to back to normal. They're having in-person meetings, et cetera, and we're still stuck in our houses. So, you know, it kind of influences your answer. Uh, but I do think that um, one thing that'll stick uh, with us is probably, at least with me, it's probably less frequent travel. Um, you know, maybe you'll be taking longer trips and trying to hit, you know, various cities all in one fell swoop rather than making a bunch of trips. So maybe less frequent travel is something that may stick. When will you resume pre-COVID travel? I hope by Labor Day. Um, where will your first trip be? Um, you know, probably to Athens is where our last trip was in late February before everything got shut down. It'll probably be our first trip. I hope it is. Um, if you could go to one restaurant for dinner tonight, what would it be? Um, you know, Texas has been open since um, early uh, May. Utah uh, was open over the weekend. So I've actually been able to go out to dinner. Um, but, you know, for the New York City crowd, probably where it would, the first restaurant I'd want to go to is probably Avra. So that's, uh, that's my wrap around. Excellent. David? Where am I? Uh, I'm in, I'm about an hour west of Manhattan in a town called Basking Ridge, New Jersey. Um, so, and I've been here for four months locked up in the house, but things are going well here. I love it out here. Uh, what do you miss most of, during the lockdown? Um, I think also just getting out, being in front of people, communicating. Um, you know, I think we're getting a lot accomplished being at home, but there's just nothing like sort of just the old way where you can get in, get in front of people, talk, communicate, go for a walk, hang out and get things accomplished in a, at a different level. Uh, music. I also have, though I'm a I'm a nut for oldies, and uh, I've been in four hour car rides at times where I've only missed one when they challenge me what song is it. Uh, the reality is I've been focusing more on books and podcasts. So I'm a nut for American history, all kinds of George Washington and things like that, Abe Lincoln. So I've discovered all these other books and podcasts on that. I go for six mile walks every day. I've walked 20 pounds off being home. Uh, 50 more to go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's the way it works. Uh, what changes do I think will stick? I think the walking has been phenomenal. And I'm walking and I'm learning as I walk, which I like a lot. Um, and uh, let's see, resuming pre-COVID travel. Hopefully, really, I, I really want to get back on the road. When countries are really reopening, that's when we can get on the ground. This, this whole video, the Zooming, the webinars, all this stuff, it's been great. We're talking to CEOs more than we've ever talked to them before because people are also not traveling and it's second best to being in the same room. But I find that it's much better than just a conference call where you can't see them. You wanna see body language, look at people in the eye. And I think this really helps to do those things. Um, my first trip will be to Europe, probably the Nordics. We have a lot of investments in Sweden and Norway. We wanna get back and really sort of get back in the swing of things and then Kind of just work my way around uh, Europe and then eventually maybe head off to Asia. One restaurant I would say there's quite a few. Uh, I'm not Italian, but I have a severe weakness for Italian food, so I want to work my way back through a bunch of the Italian restaurants in Manhattan that I have not been able to do. And then for Steakhouse, I do like Bobby Vans uh, in Midtown. I'm simple, uh, and so a great steak and some Italian food. And that's Excellent. why I'm walking a lot now so that I can eat. I'm pre-losing the weight so I can go yeah. back. Up. Excellent. Michael, <laughs> where's Waldo? Great. Hi. Hi, Matt. Good to see you. Um, I'm in my study in my house in Notting Hill. You may remember the film Notting Hill. I don't have Julia Roberts beside me, unfortunately. But I am, <laughs> I am sitting on, I'm sitting on Greta and, and Donald Trump. This is a cushion of the famous meeting in the UN last September and you can see she looks very angry. Anyway, I sit on them to uh, make the chair I'm sitting on slightly more manageable. Um, what do I miss during the lockdown? People, obviously family, missing colleagues, 
uh, I saw my granddaughter for the first time in three months. My oldest son is a frontline intensive care doctor, so obviously we had to stay away from, from them for the uh, requisite amount of time. I also miss seeing Jim in his white suit and his brown shoes, and, and I'm sorry that he's not appearing. Maybe he's somewhere in the background there. Music I listen to most. I haven't really listened to any music because I've spent most of my time on incessant conference calls. Some of them worthwhile, not all of them. And so the actual music I've listened to most is the city conference call music waiting for the host to open the conference call. It probably has a name, but I don't know what it is. But whoever composed it is no doubt earning a lot of money. What changes will stick in your life? I think Zoom, I think flexible working. But I have to say, unlike David, I don't think I've worked as hard in the last three months. I mean, it is intense. And that getting up and wandering around and having a conversation with someone, bouncing ideas off people is much less easy in this environment. So, but I think it'll be that mixture. I think the great thing for all of us and our colleagues is it'll allow much more flexible working for everyone. Resuming pre-COVID travel, fourth quarter, I think, hopefully. I mean, I think it'll either be to Greece or to Copenhagen. The work of the Global Maritime Forum goes on um, and the Coalition to Zero and stuff. So maybe Copenhagen. My actual first trip abroad will be to my house in France, probably on the 6th of July, where I will go and work from France for a couple of months, maybe. Um, and if I could go to a restaurant for dinner tonight, it'd be the one I went to last before the lockdown. It's a place called Core, C-O-R-E, here in Notting Hill, two Michelin stars, uh, excellent food, and hopefully will reopen. Unfortunately, a number of restaurants in London have already announced they won't be reopening. One of them also near where I live called The Ledbury, another famous restaurant with an Australian owner who's decided it's too too difficult to open with uh, with um, spacing out and stuff. So anyway, good to be on here and I look forward to uh, another session um, where we can tell you what we think. Oh, and by the way, I took my yeah. beard off. I took my I took my beard off, but this is my first beard from 1977. So that's 43 <laughs> years ago. Yeah, so, so Michael, I guess the first question is for you. Um, almost everyone I know has, has grown a beard during COVID and you shaved yours. Was there any particular reason for that? Well, um, apart from the obvious, which was my wife nagging me, it was that COVID, uh, the, the climate change conference, COP26, which was supposed to take place in November in Glasgow, which is where I was born, has been postponed and so it seemed to me that, that keeping it for 18 months was going to test my wife's patience and also um, <laughs> and the more people started saying how it aged me the more I decided it was time to take it off so I took it off what I've noticed from all the zoom calls is how many other beards have grown and what would be interesting to see is how many of those stay for when we all go back into the office okay well we'll have to uh, we, maybe we take a poll on that John so that's great. Okay, so we have a lot of ground to cover, and thank you guys for kind of telling us uh, your background. I am actually sitting in a town called Chatham, Massachusetts, which is um, probably as close as I can get to uh, Notting Hill without going over the ocean. We're about uh, two hours east of Boston, uh, out on Cape Cod, sort of facing Nantucket Island. Um, so um, we have a lot of ground to cover, as I said. I'm basically going to organize this discussion in a, in a few different um basic categories, but we won't necessarily stick to those, but that's how we'll start. We're gonna begin with credit markets, then we're gonna talk about capital markets, then we're gonna get into valuation and sort of the, the equity uh, considerations, and then we're gonna finish up with ESG. So obviously a lot of those things are kind of um, part of a uh, system that works together, so we'll, we won't um, necessarily stick exactly to that, but, but let's start there. Um, Michael, credit markets obviously are the lifeblood of this industry. I mean, if you look at, at uh, the sort of um, uh, cycle to kind of mid-cycle to mid-cycle returns, high single digits, I mean, uh, cheap bank debt is kind of essential to making equity returns work for guys like David and financial products kind of work for, for what Doug is doing. Can you tell us like what's going on in the, in the um, shipping uh, commercial loan market and uh, maybe how or if whether COVID has had any effect on that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, some of the trends we saw before are still operating, but obviously COVID has introduced a new stress. In particular, I mean, you've got the, the two sectors, 
hugely affected the cruise sector clearly and and the offshore sector which was grinding a slow recovery that's been set back and we'll see whether that setback sort of sticks or whether you know stabilizing oil prices sort of brings that you know begins to bring that back but um i think broadly speaking in the middle of the bulk of um shipping container dry wet um you know has has carried on as before without though the benefit of people being able to physically meet so a number of those deals that get struck or structures that get discussed it's it's more difficult to do it this way um and so that may mean that things that might have happened if we were all in the office have been delayed it does mean that some things that were under discussion just taking a bit longer what i would say is inevitably in 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 a constrained capital environment pricing goes up so ship owners are paying more than they were pre-crisis and that's a function of the rationing of capital the rationing of credit going on but what is what i think is good is that the capital markets you know have shown that they really are functioning well we saw more broadly in the crisis and i'm speaking broadly to the overall corporate sector that uh, apart from a bit of wobble in the commercial paper market you know the bond market particularly obviously for investment grade, you know, responded very quickly. So many big companies that came to banks for liquidity rapidly had those taken out in the bond market. And I think that that, broadly speaking, would apply to those sectors of shipping where credit quality hasn't fallen. But there is clearly, we're still only sort of halfway through this. We saw the contango in the tanker market being great. We've seen dry beginning to maybe to recover and the container sector. We've seen all the lessons that were learned. But, you know, the jury is still out on demand in the Western economies and, and, and the overall supply chain. So I think, you know, when I sit in on broader senior calls in city around those sectors that are stressed, like aviation, like energy, like autos, every time I hear the word shipping, I interject and say, no, broadly speaking, shipping is not. It's, and the reason for that is twofold. One is the supply of, you know, the, the supply overhang isn't there. It's very tight and that's very good because it means there isn't a wall of new buildings about to come in. That's the first thing. And that managing of capacity, particularly as illustrated in the container sector, is very important for confidence, I think, of banks. Uh, and secondly, a lot of money had already left shipping. I know you're going to talk about league tables later on. But there wasn't a lot of money coming in from the banks. There was refinancing going on. And at the top end, quality, if you like, the bigger companies were able to uh, arrange new building finance and stuff. And, and so I don't think there's been a dramatic change. But let's see what happens in the next few months, because shipping does depend, of course, on ultimately the consumer and the manufacturers to get back to some sort of normal, normal economic activity. Yeah, th thanks for that. I mean, one thing has been really clear in the last, you know, call it 10 years, is the interconnectedness between the commercial loan market or the shipping market and the capital markets. And Doug, what you do, and, and David, the kinds of things you invest in. I mean, it's become a much more synergistic kind of relationship. You know, it used to be very, you know, opportunistic, and there were moments in time. I remember Jeff Krieber always, when he was a banker, talking about the window, you know, is the window open or is the window closed? Uh, it's become much more collaborative. Um, David, from your perspective, uh, I mean, we haven't seen a lot of equity. Well, it's my sense that we haven't seen a lot of equity issuance during the crisis. I mean, Michael seems to indicate that that's because people haven't needed money. Um, maybe Could you comment a little bit? Even like when the tanker market ran up in the past, you would have seen companies issuing stock. Uh, can you talk about kind of the, the um, follow on and, and kind of, uh, you know, market for additional equity issuance? Sure. Well, I, I, I would say that just a couple of weeks ago, I think Frontline filed a shelf uh, to issue equity. They didn't actually issue, issue any. So I think they're starting to think about it. You, look, you're, you're right. Normally, when you, you see an environment, a stressed out environment, you, you start to see investors um, or the companies think about how can we get additional capital. You know, if you go back a little bit, I, maybe I'll give I'll go back a little bit. I only started investing in maritime related investments in early 2016. And when I got to the sector, it really was going, of course, through the end of the Chinese cycle growth, and you had this bust cycle. And we saw back then the banks were done. They were up to their, their gills, if they had gills, in, in being fed up and they had no interest. 
and the companies were forced to issue equity. And so we started by investing in equity that was designed to reflate the balance sheets. And our view was all these companies can't go out of business. There's going to be winners. There's going to be losers. We have to figure out who, who's who. And it was a phenomenal time to invest because a crisis does create an opportunity. So in this pandemic period, we're seeing, look, we were already seeing the slowdown from China uh, as we started the year, right? When they started extending the, the Chinese New Year and so forth, you started to see all kinds of issues coming on. And then of course, with Saudi Arabia and Russia on, the, on, the, on sort of pumping full out on oil, it really created a lot of just moving parts here. Um, are we surprised that that their companies are not really out there issuing? I think companies have evolved over the last couple of years to a different level of understanding. It could go right out the window very quickly, but I think companies have been better generally in the space at hoarding cash, at trying to optimize the balance sheet a little bit better than they did in the past, and thinking through the way uh, they raise capital, be it debt, be it equity. The banks seem to be a little more open again um, for, for discussions. Can we push out our runway if I'm a corporate? I'll raise maybe some equity and then the banks work with, with the companies. So you're seeing a diverse group of, of outcomes. You know, you have everybody from, from uh, John Wobensmith at Genco who really has over the years hoarded cash. And then only in the last one year perhaps started paying out dividends when they were comfortable that there was a better environment. And I think that's the kind of thing that, I guess we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, but I, I would expect that you'll see companies starting to say, look, even though we see a good outlook in the long, intermediate and longer term, I think you're gonna start to see uh, companies start to raise money here and there or try to, because investors are also more open again. That cycle of investors being pissed off frustrated, annoyed, second guessing why they ever invested in this space. It, it is just like a, like a big wave in the ocean. And I think we're at the point where they're gonna come back again. Um, we're, we're starting to hear, we're getting calls from, another, from other investors as well. So there's definitely okay, interest good. again. Yeah, that's good to it's good to good to hear. Doug, let's turn it over to you. I mean, you're obviously sitting in a in a very important seat here. I mean, Jeffries has had the leading, you know, marine um, investment banking franchise for for decades and uh, has been consistently covering the sector. Um, I was thinking of this topic. Uh, I was listening to the ESG webinar on Monday, and Ted Jaddick was talking about DNB, and uh, he said that they have fewer clients. They're more selective, they have less exposure, and they're more profitable. Um, and I think we're seeing that among other banks as well. Um, the idea, I guess, is that the capital markets are going to have to make up the slack here. Um, can you just talk about what the environment's like as a shipping investment banker? I mean, the kinds of conversations you're having in this market? Sure thing, Matt. Um, and my answer is going to also, I guess, tag on to some points that Michael and uh, David were making. In the sense that, you know, when you look at how and the shipping companies that exist today in the public markets, you know, they're larger, um, they have better corporate governance. Um, and so when you look at, you know, do they have the need to raise equity capital here? They really don't. Um, you know, when you look at companies that are out there, actually, instead of issuing equity capital, they're buying back their shares. Um, you know, in, in, in some uh, instances, you have some companies that have initiated dividend policies that are, are very manageable. Um, and then whenever the um, the situation required, you know, you saw a dialing down of those dividends. And I think, you know, all of that, um, you know, being in a, a, a advantageous position, a strong position, not needing to raise equity capital whenever, you know, the opportunity pre presented itself, I, I think it's all part of a, a, a better um, situation as it relates to corporate governance and whatnot. Um, you know, thinking about the opportunity for capital market issuance going forward, you know, while I just mentioned that, you know, there hasn't been a real need for the most part, um, you know, to the extent that that window, that proverbial window does open, um, then I do think, as David was mentioning, that you will see some institutional investors uh, being interested in, in understanding the opportunity to invest in the sector. Um, you know, as it relates to, you know, the credit availability, um, you know, the same argument could have been made back in 2008, 2009, whenever you had guys like, you know, RBS and, 
HSH and others retrenching from the space, and people thought that that was going to usher in a big period of uh, equity capital markets, other types of capital markets filling the the, the gap. And, and you know, it, it really didn't fill the gap as much as people were thinking at the time. Um, and, and similarly, you know, fast forward 12 years, I don't know that the capital markets all of a sudden going to be required to fill uh, the gap here. But I do think over time, I mean, it is a clear trend. You, you know, you mentioned. You know, Jeffrey's being involved in this space for decades. I mean, this isn't a long, uh, a short game. It's a long game. And so I do think that um, that there will be a an increased um, requirement on the part of the capital markets to uh, to fill that gap. But it's not going to be, you know, where people are running to the market because they have to. They, for the most part, they really don't. The the companies are in much better shape right now. Yeah, no, it's, it's it seems like it. I mean, actually, for shipping, it's been remarkably undramatic. The uh, what's happened under COVID. I mean, there's certainly been a lot of technical issues on the ships with crews and humanitarian issues. But in terms of the business, it it seems uncharacteristically, uh, you know, well functioning through this. Yeah, and if I can maybe add one more thing. So you know, obviously, I'm on the banking side over the last few years, but I wasn't always in this seat. But back whenever I was an analyst, you know, pre 2008. You would talk to investors and they would sit there and say, well, you know, why are these companies, if they believed in their in their business or the model or whatnot, why aren't they buying back shares? Now they are. Um, so, so, you know, it, they're doing the right sorts of things that met, that make them more investable to, to the general investing public. Yeah, I have to say, David, you know, kind of over to you. And I don't I'm certainly not blaming you, but just as a, as a commentary, I'm that. amazed we have these just phenomenal management teams uh, in the shipping industry. I mean, you've heard them on the webinars this week and and, I, and we all agree with that. They're just these incredible companies. Uh, but when they talk about the valuations of their businesses, you know, it's like, I think Craig Stevenson said he, he felt that Diamond S was 50 cent dollars. Uh, and it's just amazing when you know these companies and you know these people and how diligent they are and how hard they work and uh, how they manage this very difficult business. Um, David, how do you, I mean, what do you, I mean, is shipping, talk about that. I mean, how do you feel about valuation? And I guess another follow on question is when you make an investment, I know you've owned some of the, you know, uh, Scorpio tankers, bulkers, um, maybe you could talk about some of your other holdings, but like, how do you, um, how do you decide what to buy? Well, look, at the end of the day, and even at the start of the day, we're value investors. We're looking for discounts. But uh, as you may see, as you read the business news, value investing is a dying breed because there's a lot of 50 cent and 40 cent dollars out there. And the question becomes, it's not just, is it cheap? It's how do I make money here? What's the path to get to realization of value? And so these, are, these stocks are trading at, for everything that we look at. We're not maritime investors specifically we're opportunistic investors we go across sectors looking for cheap stocks where they're a catalyst for value creation i've been doing it for 30 years and what's attractive in this space is that yeah you have a lot of cheap stocks what you don't have right now is this is a sector that has not been able to string two good quarters together in a long time and you have so investors look for some level of not this this volatility where you you have a flare up of amazing amounts of of cash generation and then one or two quarters later they're on the i'm going to use a bad word here they're on the balls of their ass you know and so the bottom line is it's the swings are so rapid from low to high to low it actually will scare away some investors and investors are now sort of being indoctrinated into this view of this is this they still think it's this old cycle of boom bust, uh, pick up, build, new orders, flare up, too much capacity, economic slowdown, devastation, balance sheet problems, and restructuring. As I said before, companies are more mature today. I think they understand better what's happening throughout the whole space. How are you gonna bring in more investors that will look at it and value it differently and help you get to realization um, well, I think right now investors are fixated still on this price to NAV. They are not looking, ultimately you want investors to look at cash generation over time, over a cycle and, and things of that nature. And I think the, the net of it is that this shift will come um, when 
we start to string together more, as I say, more than one in a row of a good quarter so that it's just not so jerky in terms of the nature of how cash is generated. But what has happened, as, as you pointed out on this webinar, um, when you're seeing stock buybacks, when you're seeing debt pay down, when you're seeing sort of a more focus on how do I optimize my balance sheet, these are all pieces of the puzzle that bring investors and larger investors in. Ultimately, you need bigger companies, not in the tanker side necessarily, in the dry bulk, you have to make them more investable. You can't attract these multi-billion dollar firms when your market caps are three, four, five hundred million dollars. You're just not gonna get them. And so, yeah, that, that, yeah. No, that's a, that's a, that leads to another question. I was reading in Bloomberg over the weekend about the Robin Hood effect, Doug, and how we're seeing this incredible influx of uh, kind of small retail investors that are pushing stocks around and really pushing larger institutions around in terms of valuation. Lois mentioned from um, International Seaways, she mentioned on the, on the call a couple of days ago that they had attracted um, a much broader group of investors during the tanker and tango period. Doug, is that, or, or David, is, has the investor base, what is the right investor base and has it changed for this sector, do you think? You know, Matt, um, I would say that, you know, I don't know that there is a right investor base. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, back whenever, you know, say pre-08, whenever, you know, you were in a, a, a commodity bull market, um, shipping was doing very well. You had a lot of institutional sponsorship, but you also had some retail investors too. Um, so everyone kind of played a role, um, and and you know having that kind of mix, I, I I think is probably ideal, where you have some you know longstanding institutional investor sponsorship that understands the cyclicality. They won't run for the exits whenever you know you hit a, a downturn. Um, but then also having the, the retail guys on the on the margins, um, you know, once again they 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 are helpful to the overall uh, to their overall cause. But that's just my two cents. I know you addressed it to both David and I. Well, look, I would say to add to that, Doug, um, it's interesting, you know, you talk about Robin Hood uh, and the fact is those are, they're not just retail, they're very short term traders. Look, c commission costs for the retail investor are zero now. So you can trade in and out all day long with no cost, even options. Uh, where as an institutional investor, I actually pay commissions on options. These people sitting in their kitchens Right, right now, while we're talking on this webinar, two of my kids are sitting in the kitchen. They have Robinhood accounts. They've probably flipped a couple of stocks twice already. And it's just crazy. But, but the fact is, it, is this the right kind of an investor? Look, you want, you want a, a, a different smattering of investors. I'll, get, I'll use an example of a stock we don't own. A couple of months ago, two months ago, you had the guy from NAT, uh, Herbie and Hansen. I'm probably mispronouncing his name. He went on Kramer's show on CNBC, like that. The Robin Hood guys do what they call a meme. They call it a meme stock. They build a whole story around it. Look what this guy's saying. And they, the stock went from $3, roughly, three and change, to over seven in uh, two weeks or less, a couple of days. I think they're, we look, I look back at it and I, and I, cause my kids were asking me about it. They're like, your stocks aren't doing this, dad. And I, uh, and uh, but the net of it is there was one day where 110 million shares of that stock traded. There's like 147 million shares outstanding. So it's just this high velocity. I don't think that's necessary. I would never say what's the right kind of investor, but those are very flitty investors, flighty, where they're in now because these are hot stocks. They're trying to get on the train. They want to be on it for one stop. They're not thinking about long term or anything. They want to hear there's a long-term story, but frankly, their shorter-term traders make a few bucks on the stock or the options. And actually, that creates a massive amount of volatility because it also gives those investors the chance to buy pre- and post-market very easily with the app, buy, sell, buy, sell. And so these guys are just out there all the time. I wouldn't say that's the core investor base. Um, I think, yes, was it yesterday? You had a, the dry bulk panel. I think John yeah. Logan Smith, I'm not going to keep harping on Wovensmith, but he made some comment about it would be down the road. It, it wouldn't be crazy to have two large dry bulk companies and sort of dominating the, the industry. 
I actually think in the long run, you want to attract longer term capital that will help you in tough times and be very excited to be your partner in great times. I mean, you, you need to, you go back to this concept of consolidation. I think it's, it's, it's critically important if the companies want to sort of evolve the investor base and get away from the shorter term uh, type of investors and make this space much more investable. But in most other industries, you know, we'll, we'll invest in a company, whether it's media, telecom, industrial businesses, they're doing a capital raise for something, we like it, we participate, we wanna be there for the good times and the bad times, and we take a long-term view. Shipping, you have to kind of trade around your position, perhaps. But at the core, we have a longer-term view. And I just think as you can make these companies a little bit more scalable, they're already doing the other part. They've cleaned up their balance sheets, they're refocusing, they're, they're improving corporate governance. Those things are coming into play very positively. So we're on our way there, but it's the next part. And that's the hardest part of all, because that's where all the egos get in the way. That's where all the personalities get in the way. And I think that's yeah. that's a big stumbling block to some of the consolidation. Yeah, I mean, we actually, you know, we've been seeing a lot of consolidation, um, a lot of it private equity sponsor led. I mean, uh, and a lot of it, you know, the pool, the you know, the pooling structure has ended up being a, a catalyst for that where it was the social issues weren't as great. Um, so it's, um, Michael, from your perspective, let's talk a little bit about consolidation. Uh, this is something that, um, you know, has been on sort of conference agendas for, you know, as long as I've been going. Actually, I don't know if you know this, Michael, but the first conference I ever attended, uh, Jim Lawrence sent me to, I was a summer intern and, uh, he uh, actually um, just, I showed up at the office and he told me I was going to London to go to a conference and you were the chairman of that. That was Lloyd's Shipping Economist uh, 25 years ago. Um, so consolidation was probably on that agenda. Do you have a view as a, a private citizen or a city? I mean, do you think consolidation, do you think it will ultimately happen? Yes, <clears throat> yes, I do. And I, I think I've been saying it for at least 25 years and we've seen it. Right. Um, we've seen it in particular in the container sector. I think, um, going back to the point David made, I mean, I think the consolidation is going to come because we're missing a huge part of the bulk of shipping is the container port sector, now the supply chain. If we think about the supply chain, which is really infrastructure, and of course the whole ESG debate is about replacing the current infrastructure with some other infrastructure. That that we know the capital demands on that are going to be huge. We also know that for shipping, being part of the supply chain is going to be more attractive to investors than thinking about the single ship. Now, you're going to have to get long-term employment into those markets, like the tanker market, in order for people to be willing to invest in whatever the new type of tonnage is that's going to meet the new IMO standards and eventually the zero emission ship. So I think the external drivers for consolidation are going to be more important than the egos that may have held it back so far. And also that I think I think capital, be it debt or equity, will start to be selective around you know those companies that are performing. And performance is not just going to be near-term profitability, it's going to be long-term profitability. And it's also going to be alignment with other goals, the sustainability goals and the emissions issues. So those are going to feature for investors, I think, in a much more important way that we've never seen before. So one of the things that I think you will be talking about at the next or the one after that, hopefully when we're all together in New York, is you know the public nature of some of the container shipping companies and the ports and the need for those big companies to attract the capital, the long-term capital that infrastructure funds may be willing to invest privately, but actually institutional investors should be part of that. So mm -hmm. consolidation is the long-term necessity for the industry. Whether competition authorities allow it in certain sectors, of course, is, is an issue. We've seen in the chemical sector many years ago, the car carrier sector, we've seen you know, oligopolies uh, you know, have problems from misbehaving as it were so you know i think there'll be there'll be um issues potentially around uh, over consolidation in some sectors but but i think we've got to start thinking about shipping as 
part of the supply chain and part of the infrastructure of global trade and less about the individual ship. Um, yeah. And I think that's where valuation will come because I think it'll go back to being cash flow valuations based off predictable, sustainable revenues and not asset value. Okay. No, I think that's a good point. And, and it's a good segue to um, the ESG topic, which we'll uh, finish off with. And then I'll take some questions from the, I'm getting a lot of questions on the, on the screen here. Um, Doug, I think um, what many of us love about shipping, or at least one of the things that I love about shipping is, you know, the, the independence of owners, the entrepreneurial spirit, the sort of almost non-corporatized elements of the business. Um, and when I started, I remember there were a lot of guys, Gre the Greeks were who I remember most clearly that were, you know, ambitious young management teams from Greece who would, uh, you know, maybe they had a history of shipping, but they needed capital to, to sort of build a business and they were really excited about it. And, you know, Wall Street played a big role in that. Um, do you still see those smaller owners with, a, you know, with a dream and trying to put together capital to to uh to build their businesses yeah matt we certainly still see them um however i think our guidance and advice today in 2020 is different than it was say pre-2008 um you know when we hear what david and mike were talking about as it relates to consolidation and all of the benefits that we all know about um everything from you know the scale the uh, you know and what that leads to is just better when people think about a consolidation, think about you know discipline. They think about economies of scale, economy that relates to capital availability, whether it's quantum or price. Um, so all those things are critically important um, in 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 today in today's day and age. Um, but but you know as you mentioned, there are still those entrepreneurs out there. And so our advice, you know, we all know who some of the smaller companies were pre 2008 um, that probably went in in hindsight went to the markets maybe a little bit too early um and, and they aren't in the public markets anymore so our advice today is you know it's, it's a phenomenal industry it is critically important to to, to global trade to the global infrastructure i mean 90 percent of global trade happens on a ship um so it, you know its importance cannot be understated um but but there are, there are various ways to grow and achieve the scale that is required um so when you look at the availability of bank debt for example you know it, it's while less, it's still relatively plentiful compared to other industries. Um, and when you look at the pricing, um, you know, it, it, the cost of capital is is quite attractive. And so, you know, you can grow without the public markets until you get to a certain size threshold. Um, and, and so, you know, our advice isn't, hey, run to the markets with your six ships, um, you know, as happened, you know, 15 years ago, that, that won't fly, but grow your six ships into 20 or 30 and then all of a sudden then then it's a different uh different dynamic i mean one of the logical ways to capitalize that is, is private equity right doug i mean can you just uh take a minute to kind of give an overview on where the private equity for shipping market is today yes yeah, certainly um definitely private equity is a means to that end um it's one means to that end it's not the only um, but when we speak with private equity investors, it kind of depends on the sector that they're invested in. Um, you know, if you talk to a private equity investor that has a fleet of dry bulk carriers, um, that may be different than uh, talking to a private equity investor that has a fleet of refined product carriers. Um, so one may be, you know, looking for an exit. One may be looking for, you know, to, to see how they can grow it further. Um, I would say that in addition to the legacy owners of fleets, um, you know, there's still private equity um, capital that is available to, to be put to work, um, you know, pre-COVID and even post-COVID. You know, we were talking to a number of infrastructure fund investors um, that were looking to put money to work in shipping. And, you know, pre-COVID, it started with, well, let's look at, you know, even though we're infrastructure, um, let's look at things that are infrastructure like um, long-term contracts that, you know, provided a certain return threshold. That's something that would be of interest to us. Um, Post-COVID, um, a lot of the conversations are, all right, well, we're in a unique world right now. So what maybe what wasn't deemed infrastructure pre, we can make the argument that it's infrastructure post. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, that there is there is capital out there. Yeah. Um, Need a story. 
All right, so I'm going to ask each of you guys a question, and you only have um, you can only take one word to answer it. Um, Jay Powell came out this week of the U.S. Fed and said that interest rates would stay at zero basically forever. Um, starting with David, then Michael, then Doug, uh, does it matter? Will that affect shipping in any way? Yes or no? I think ultimately yes. Do you want me to say more than that, or just yes okay, or no? Like, like thirty seconds. Okay. Well, look, lower rates. I mean, look, uh, it, it allows companies with debt to refinance at cheaper and cheaper levels. People think that zero rates means everybody pays zero. It's obviously not the case. But we're seeing companies from Hapag Lloyd on down who have continuously been able to refinance their balance sheets at lower and lower cost. That should continue, and I think that bodes well. In the long run, that could create a bubble. But in the short to intermediate term, this is a great opportunity for companies to really again keep evolving more positively their balance sheets so i think it does and that's for many sectors but this one especially which is a heavy michael, debt oriented business michael a cynic would say that the banks will just keep the the extra spread uh, what do you think well i agree with everything david said but obviously the way equity investors look at banks they'd like higher interest rates because um clearly that's good for banks so as a shareholder and employee of a major bank, I would prefer higher interest rates. But I, in the short term, I look at the economy, the global economy needs it. But we know that it can't work in the long run. And you know, we've had massive, we were already sitting on massive liquidity from all the quantitative easing before COVID. I mean, what's gonna happen is someone, some point is gonna say, central banks are just printing money. And, and, and so, you know, two years, great, but if we don't get back to some sort of balancing um, in the in the global monetary system as well, you know, we're just storing up huge problems for the future. I think the key yeah. thing, as long as yeah. as long as people are not investing, are not building businesses based entirely on cheap money, then that's fine too. It's got to be sensible in a in a higher interest rate environment. And I hope you're going to get onto ESG eventually. Yeah, we've got uh, that's that's we're gonna we're gonna end on a high note. Uh, Doug, you want to take a, a interest rates had any effect on your business? Yeah, I, I think Matt, it depends on, and Michael brought up a great point: the duration. How long are interest rates slow? Um, because you know, if interest rates are low, all asset prices uh, increase, whether it's ships, whether it's commodities, whether it's equities, whether it's real estate, whether it's whatever. Um, and it just depends on how long the pedal is to the metal with uh, with low rates. Because if it's too long. We can have issues um, if it's only a couple of years. Um, you know, it should be helpful. Okay. So, so, can I just add one thing, which is, yeah. at the end of the day, people are people and people don't change. So if it really lasts much long, really long period of time, eventually people just say, "Look, the money's too cheap. I will take as much as I can and I will invest." And you'll start to see really, an ex you'll get a, a, a transformed level of asset prices. People will want to do things that they wouldn't do in a more normal, organized market. We're not there yet, but you can get there if it continues. Yeah, on. no, definitely. Five trillion dollars, that's Dow 50,000. So Michael, you brought up ESG and I actually have gotten a lot of questions on the box about ESG. And I think from my perspective, it's, um, it's a super exciting opportunity for this industry and for all of us involved with it on, on a lot of different levels. It's really, I don't remember anything uh, in my career that was kind of as exciting. Um, you know, David, you mentioned that, that value investors are, are a dying breed or I can't remember. I think those were your words. Um, ESG funds actually are seeing net inflows. I think it's the only strategy that's seeing net inflows. Um, so I want to, I want to talk a little bit about ESG, um, and shipping. Michael, I think you're a logical place to start. You were an architect or one of the architects of the Poseidon principles, which I think is well known. It was launched, uh, it's actually exactly a year ago, I believe, at Marine Money, during yep. Marine Money. Um, in that process, I mean, it must have, you must have spent a lot of time in having conversations and thinking about this. Can you just tell us kind of what surprised you, for better or worse, about that process, uh, you know, getting to the launch of it, creating it, and then what's happened in the last 12 months? Well, let me just get nearer the camera so you can see my Poseidon Principles badge there. And my sustainable development goals badge too. Where, where's um, the tattoo? Yeah, tomorrow is <laughs> <laughs> on my on one of my son's right shoulders, not on mine. <laughs> um, no, look, uh, tomorrow is the first anniversary, and it was a great event a year ago in the Pierre 
helped by marine money um, uh, to help uh, arrange that event and uh, you know we were 11 signatories a year ago we are now 18 and will continue to grow um, and I also want to take this opportunity to congratulate International Seaways for publishing their climate alignment uh, fleet-wide climate alignment consistent with the deal they agreed with certain banks and I think for a company moving fossil fuels to come out with that um, that, that, that calculation I think is, is, is great and they should really be congratulated Bill and um, Jeff and Lois and the team there. And what we're seeing is we're in the process literally now of getting the data which ship owners had to provide by the end of last month to their classification societies for veri verification. So it's the first year and inevitably of course we're getting questions from certain sectors of shipping about why it doesn't make sense for them or some of the issues and we we knew all that as we were going through the drafting process that we're not going to satisfy everyone but you have to start somewhere and i think as was said at the launch by various um um various uh people sitting on that panel one of whom was um the representative of that uh, big investor in in the esg funds whose name i forget but um one of the most advanced us investors in this stuff that you know we we led as a sector this is shipping leading, which we were able to do because of a global regulator and being a global industry. And what we're, I think, seeing through all the other work going on is how other sectors who own the cargoes that are being carried by the ships now recognize that the lead we gave is something they are having to align to as well. And you're going to see, you're going to see a lot more announcements in the next few months, given we have the technology to measure emissions in real time. Uh, and we're going to see that the charterers are going to start selecting ships for their cargoes based upon emissions. So we, it's going to be transformative. And I think for the industry, it is the best thing ever. It is what will make this industry profitable because partly it's to do with they don't know what ships to order. And if you don't order a ship that is LNG fueled today, then what are you going to order? And of course, if you order an LNG fueled ship, you know, you're worried about whether, you know, that'll be a stranded asset at some point. So there's a lot of caution going on. So what we're learning is really learning as we go along. And I think that we will end up, uh, provided the politics of the world don't get in the way, we'll end up with all, all banks and lessors eventually signing up to it. So we expect more to sign. And I think we, we live with this. The key word, and I don't know if it came up in the decarbonisation webinar, which unfortunately I couldn't join, is the key word is transition. And I think it's very important that we embrace transition so that we avoid the extremists, the head in the sand, nothing to do with me, or the extremists in the other sense that anything that has fossil associated with it is a bad thing. There will be zero emission ships by 2030, that's the plan. But between now and then, we have to keep reducing emissions. And when people say, well, with lower fuel prices, at lower oil prices, people won't want to do that. Believe me, the cleaner skies over Europe and everywhere, everyone can see. And they'll calculate how many million people won't have died of pollution as a result of the lockdown, uh, as well as how many more people died because of late lockdowns or whatever it is in, in terms of COVID. So to me, this is the biggest issue for shipping because shipping plays such an important part in the global economy and we should embrace it and make it work for us. And I think this is where all the points David and Doug make is real value is going to come in shipping companies from the way in which the cargo owners select the companies they want to move their cargoes with and how the financiers, be they banks or ultimately equity investors, choose to lend or to invest. And it won't be, a, won't be overnight, but it'll be, things will start to happen. And they, they're not a one-off, they're only going to get more and more significant for the industry and that's one of the things that's going to speed up consolidation too yeah no i think that's right i mean it's it feels more collaborative than than any other effort that i can remember among stakeholders which is really yeah. you know very very exciting um and if i could say you're you're evolving to doers not just talkers because yeah. when this started they were talking using the buzz buzzwords and just saying these things I, we would go into meetings and they'd be like before you'd say hello they'd say let us tell you about our ESG focus. You didn't even sit down yet. And then you realize they weren't doing anything but talking about it. Now you're seeing them do it. Big difference. 
Yeah, so that, that's really starting to pick up very nicely. And I think it, it is it is a game changer kind of bubbling up now. Yeah, no, it right. definitely did. And Matt, if I might be able to if I might yeah. be able to add to that, just from a capital market standpoint, right? Um, you know, while the companies have been on their front foot leading, and not just the E, but the S and the G as well. Um, there haven't been a ton of capital markets transactions, but during the capital markets transactions that have taken place since the last Marine Money, investors ask about it too. And it's an important point of as far as, you know, does this company have good ESG principles in place or not and, and go into specifics, et cetera. So it's not just, you know, from an industry standpoint, but from a capital market standpoint, investors are, you know, it is a, um, it is a uh, important point for investors before they decide they want to get an, invest in a specific name. Yeah, no, it's super. It is a really, it's a rallying point. I think um, if anyone, um, for those of you who didn't attend the ESG webinar on Monday, uh, that was recorded. And I, I would urge you to check it out because um, it was fantastic, really. I mean, Tony Gurney, Arlie Sterling, Joanna from, from GM. I mean, it was really uh, inspiring. And um, from big picture things, from the Environmental Defense Fund to, to Tony Gurney talking about 3% reductions in emissions by, you know, reconfiguring up the propeller of the ship. I mean, really, uh, really, really cool. Um, David, what, do you think about ESG as an investor? I mean, the cycle of shipping stocks has been compressed to like hours, right? I mean, I look at this stuff and I, 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 I feel for you because it seems so challenging, right? I mean, you have an industry where companies and ships and seafarers are, you know, grinding it out for sort of, you know, low double digit returns and then you have these stocks that could be going 20 percent up or down in a day i mean if you david marcus believe in a super cycle which i think many of us do which is going to be driven by a lack of new ordering for the reasons that michael describes okay so let's say you believe in that you buy that like then what how do you as an equity guy like how do you execute on that well look i i think there's a number of things in, in your question there, but on the, on the the ESG part, your first part of your question, it's 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 a significant input. It's like it's like any other investment. You take all these inputs and you make your decision. And so here, this is a, a group of inputs that maybe even just a few years ago we just didn't focus as much on. We focus more on what can we, what kind of returns can we expect here, and then risk adjust it and risk assess it, uh, and. The fact is you want to be more aware of it. Our own clients, our own investors, and we are also investors in our own fund. So we too want to see things improve, but it's especially the it's it's the E side, it's but it's also especially the G side, where you want to see governance. Better investments come out of better governance. Better opportunities come out of that as well. You want to know there's alignment, there's perspective. It's not management saying, how can I take advantage of my investors? It's There's an alignment. And so as you continuously tick up the quality of governance, when you are also focused on, I mean, all three letters, but also on the E side, on the environment, uh, it, it sort of, it just evolves it forward nicely. Um, and it gets into the mindset of the companies over time. It shouldn't be something that they feel it's another box to check. It should really be part of their DNA ultimately. And the more and more this evolves, I think that will be part of it. Look, we can invest, I said it before, in any area. We're special situations investors. We don't have to invest in shipping or anything in maritime. We're choosing to do it. Now, maybe we're crazy. When I started doing it three or four years ago, I had hair. Look at me today. Uh, and so the reality <laughs> is this is an industry that can can do wonders to you. You know, I'm only 25 years old. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, the, but the reality is that you can you we chose it because we said the simplest thing of all crisis creates opportunity in 16 we saw crisis we're seeing it again today crisis creates opportunity it always has it always will you could go back in history as far as you want to a health crisis to an economic crisis to any kind of crisis investors all always always look back and say why wasn't i buying more why wasn't i doing more and the reality is it will just always happen. That's sort of part of how people are. But the, the the crux of it is the crisis, it's always a different crisis, but the outcome is always the same. People, you know, in the financial crisis, investors were like, Wall Street will never make money that way again. It just won't happen. And they were right. Wall Street didn't make money. No offense to you two guys. 
Wall Street didn't make money that way again. They found another way to make even more money. And so that's what happens. People innovate, they create, and they evolve. This maritime area is, is no different. And so as ESG becomes more prevalent, as interest rates are low, as managements have learned from so many mistakes over so many cycles and are trying to more institutionalize the way they think, not every management is trying to do that, but you're seeing a movement towards doing that. It creates, as we said before, more investable securities. And so I just think that we're evolving in an area, and I, I don't know if it's one of your questions coming up, but the fact is we are so teed up so well in maritime. If, if you believe all this pickup in the markets is showing that there's a tick up ultimately out there, the one area that has not participated at all is this area, especially in the dry bulk area. And so the fact is you can't have all this these flare-ups of, of positive perspective, but trade doesn't pick up. It just it, it, it doesn't work. And so if you believe there's a pickup, this is it. And again, crisis will cre is creating these opportunities. And investors' mentality is I should be all in or all out. You don't have to be all in or all out. You could dip your toes in, your ankles in, your knees in. You don't have to be all in, but you should be in. And so we are taking advantage of this crisis like we did four years ago when we started. Yeah. I hope I didn't go off the reservation. I, I expanded your question. No, you're good. Actually, you know, I wish we had another hour to spend together or we could adjourn to uh, lunch at La Galou on Madison Avenue. But unfortunately, we're out of time. And um, I have to say, it's been a total honor and a privilege to to moderate you guys, it's it's um, it's it really is inspirational. You know, I mean, 2020, I think we were all expecting it to be the greatest year ever. Hit a major speed bump uh, in so many ways. You know, health being you know the most significant. But I mean, I, I think what I feel in the market, talking to you guys and management teams and investors, is a kind of a renewed optimism and a and an excitement for for kind of a future, as David said, to not waste an opportunity. Um, and a lot of that will be driven by a lack of new buildings. I think it was Hamish or Norton or Tony said, you'd have to be insane to order a 20 year asset today without any clear guidelines uh, on sort of what will be, um, you know, to make sure it won't be obsolete. And that's a kind of a, a, a factor we've never had in the industry. Um, and so David, if you're right about demand, I think, you know, supply looks to be in good shape. It is a chance to do something really great. And I hope we'll have a chance to to get together uh hopefully before next june but uh whenever the moment uh, comes we're we like sort of err on the side of safety like all of you it's it's very important it's kind of i see here people are definitely loosening up and it's kind of easy to lose discipline but it is a serious situation and um we're very grateful to have you uh on the screen and hopefully we'll get together uh you know when the time is right so thanks everybody for joining us and uh don't miss robert bugby's bingo tomorrow uh there is cash prizes uh, so bring your kids and, uh, you know, we're, we'll try to have some fun with it. All right. Th thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Take care guys. Take care. Take care.